The MS Association of America has published a treatment guide for disease-modifying therapies for MS. Check it out in the link below along with other sources for this video. But is it any good? Now, bear in mind, this video is going to be a harsh critique, and I'm not really trying to pick on the MSAA. I could have gone after many other sources of online information. I just happened to see this one. In fact, the MSAA is a great charity. It has the MRI fund, a lot of useful information. It has some resources and financial assistance for the cooling vests for people with MS. I even donated my own old car to this charity, and you should too, by the way. But I'm trying to make a a very important point in this video, which is the potential biases in online information. And remember, criticism isn't so bad. Remember what Albert Hubbard said, to avoid criticism, do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. So let's take a look at the treatment guide. You can watch a welcome message here if you want to, and you can see all the different medications, and it has a nice layout. You can sort from A to Z or by most recently approved, so you can find the medication you're looking for. Hopefully this does not imply that newer medications are better, which is not necessarily the case. You can filter by mode of administration, like oral medications, the pills, self-injected medications, or infusibles, and the type of MS you're treated. And this is based on what is listed on the product label. It has a brief message on opting out of treatment and on treatment philosophy, such as escalation, in other words, starting with less effective but safer medications, and only moving to stronger, more dangerous medications if needed, versus early high efficacy therapy, in other words, induction therapy. The video message seems to favor induction therapy, and you can see all the different medications. Now just take a look at the different options here, and I want you to just stop the video, and I'd be really interested to know, does anything strike you here? Just stop and post in the comments and let me know what you think about it. Of course, I picked up on this in two seconds, but I'm very interested to know what the viewer thinks. Now before we go on, let's move down to to the bottom, which shows how this was created, and it says the MSAA Ultimate MS Treatment Guide has been made possible through generous support from the following. And of course, these are drug companies which promote multiple sclerosis drugs. You can see Johnson & Johnson it was listed on top. I'm not sure why. Maybe they gave the majority of the money and some other well-known drug companies. And I'm not necessarily against this. After all, the website costs money. Developers cost money. Bandwidth costs money. They had to pay experts potentially to help them gather this information and to make videos you can watch by clicking on each drug. But just for full disclosure, Avidex, Tecfidera, and Tysabri are made by by Biogen, Convery by Johnson & Johnson, Maven Glad by EMD Serono, Zaposia by Bristol Myers Squibb, and also Gelenia by Novartis, and Abagio and Tolabrutinid, not yet FDA approved, are made by Sanofi. And you might think I'm leading into a criticism where I'm going to accuse this website of favoring the pharmaceuticals that sponsored the website, maybe by downplaying side effects for those drugs and making the drugs seem more effective relative to their competitors. But that's actually not the case. For example, Copaxone is promoted by Teva, who apparently didn't sponsor this program. And I would say it's roughly fair. I think the side effects are pretty straightforward, well-recognized side effects, and they don't really compare the relative efficacy of the drug. So I'm really talking about something else. So first, I'm going to nitpick individual characterizations of specific drugs. And just to show you, they, for example, this is a Baggio, and they kind of break it down into side effects, which are common, occurring in more than 1 in 100 people, and in rare side effects. And you can see a Baggio or teraflunamide, which is a once-daily pill. It can cause an increase in liver enzymes, nausea and diarrhea, and hair thinning. This is all true, and less commonly, it can cause severe liver inflammation, and this is all fairly accurate. There's also a compare function where you could click a few of the drugs and compare them side by side. And for instance, you can see when they were FDA approved, the type of drug, is it a pill injection or infusible, how it's taken, for what it is indicated for, and the general side effects, contraindications, and pregnancy and breastfeeding. Now, of course, this is intended to be a list, just some general information, not conclusive, but let's nitpick pick a little bit here. Let's take a look at Avonex. So we can see the common side effects, flu-like symptoms, 
upper respiratory tract infection? Well, not exactly. This drug has no increased risk of infection, and this is demonstrated very clearly by excellent observational studies. You can get lowered white blood cell count and liver test abnormalities. What about less common side effects? Heart failure, you know, I'm not so sure that's a well-recognized side effect. Seizures, Again, that's not really a recognized side effects. I'm not aware of epilepsy or heart failure being contraindications to taking this medication, but they list it here maybe based on case reports. It's a little bit misleading. For example, later on, we can see the drug Novantrone also lists heart failure as a rare side effect. But with with Novantrone, it really is a side effect of the medication, and it's actually quite common, and very specific monitoring is required for this medication, and there is a maximum lifetime dose because of the risk of heart failure. But you can see it listed in the same category. So heart failure is definitely a significant side effect of this medication, a toxicity-limiting side effect, and with Avonex, I'm not so sure. So it's very misleading to list them like that. Let's look at a few other examples. This is Lemtrada and infusible high efficacy medications. You can see the common side effects, infusion site reactions, increased risk of infections, over or underactive thyroid. This is definitely accurate. Then you can see emergent autoimmune diseases. So this drug has a risk of secondary autoimmune diseases, such as thyroiditis, and thyroiditis is the most common, and so they did list that as one of the common side effects. But other systemic autoimmune diseases are definitely more common than one in 100, so it shouldn't really be listed as a rare side effect, because they kind of have a separate category for common side effects that are more frequent than 1 in 100, so a little bit misleading there. What about Casimpta? You can see some of the common side effects, headache and upper respiratory tract infections. Okay, those are definitely side effects. Local infections, let's go to rare side effects. Okay, hepatitis B and C reactivation. Of course, that's uncommon because most people don't have hepatitis B or C. PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, yeah. That's very rare with this medication. In fact, I'm not aware of any case reports for specifically Casimpta, but it's been reported with rituximab and Ucrevus. What about weakened immune system as a rare side effect? But this medication lyses your B cells. It is an immunosuppressant. Everyone, 100% of people taking it are immunosuppressed. It just doesn't make sense to list it as a rare side effect, especially when you're listing infections as a common side effect with another medication much less likely to cause side effects. So you can see it's a little bit misleading here, and I won't go through all the details, but the point is that many of the side effects can be a little bit misleading. You really need to know exactly what is a common side effect and what is a rare but serious side effect that's specifically associated with the medication. Now, for instance, with Tysabri, of course, they list PML because the risk of actually getting PML, the feared infection of the brain caused by the J C virus is about a hundredfold more likely with this medication than other immunosuppressants, but it's listed in the exact same place for Tecfidera where the risk is less than 1 in 20,000 to my knowledge. So most people wouldn't particularly care about the risk of PML with Tecfidera just because it's so rare, it's so much more likely of getting another infection or even dying in a random unrelated car accident. Whereas with Tysabri, the risk can be as high as 1 in 100 if you're JC virus antibody positive with high index and previously received immunosuppressants. So it's a very significant concern, but it looks like they're about the same when compared compared head to head here, you get my point. But all of that is inconsequential and is not really the main point of this video. And again, I'll give you a second chance to stop and post in the comments if you know what I'm about to say. Okay, I've teased you enough, I'll let it out, which is simply that many drugs which are used to treat multiple sclerosis are just not on this list at all. And in my opinion, for absolutely no good reason. I'll give you some examples. Interferon beta 1A, beta seron is one of the brands, but there's another brand, Extavia, which is the same drug, an identical formulation. Why not just list interferon beta 1B, and you could say in the small text, 
and there are different brands such as Beta Ceron and Extavia. Same thing with Copaxone. Glutyramer acetate is generic, and there are other biosimilars. Now, they're biosimilars, not identical like interferon beta 1b, but there's no evidence that one formulation is better than another. So, why favor Copaxone? Just because it's the original gangster, because it was the first to be FDA approved? That's not evidence based at all and simply makes no sense and gives a false favoritism to Copaxone. And by the way, as I said, Teva didn't even sponsor this, so it's not as though this the people who made this are selling out or something and what about drugs that have been used for multiple sclerosis for decades but aren't listed here a lot of pills are listed for ms but what about things like azathioprine which has an excellent safety profile and good evidence in multiple sclerosis it simply doesn't appear here and what about drugs like rituximab a b cell depleter that was before ocrevus and Cassimpta and has been used in multiple sclerosis since the early 2000s and simply doesn't appear here. Well, maybe the answer is because those last two drugs I mentioned are not FDA approved for MS. In other words, if you look at the product label, multiple sclerosis is not listed. But does that mean the drug isn't safe and effective? Of course not. That's ridiculous. FDA approval is ultimately an economic and marketing decision made by a drug company. Azathioprine has been generic for decades. So who is going to have the economic incentive to go through the very expensive process of getting it formally FDA approved? No one. It will never be FDA approved. It's not as though the FDA rejected it. It just wasn't formally considered. The same thing with rituximab. It's already approved for rheumatoid arthritis and various cancers. The safety profile is various well known. There are multiple randomized trials published in multiple sclerosis, but it's not economically favorable for FDA approval to be pursued because the drug is already generic and it didn't have a half a long patent life when it started being used in multiple sclerosis. And I have a few slides to back up these claims. For instance, the difference between Extavia made by Novartis and Beta Ceron made by Bayer is 100% just a pharmaceutical dispute from Claim Secure. Quote, Extavia is the identical medicinal product as Beta Ceron, produced with identical manufacturing and establishment standards. Therefore, Extavia is identical in efficacy and safety to Beta Ceron. That makes perfect sense to me. What about azathioprine or imuran, the dirt cheap pill that's been used for multiple sclerosis for a long time? It may actually be better than interferons. This is a randomized controlled trial against mixed interferons, beta seron, avinex, and rebif. There were fewer relapses with imuran. The mean relapse with, with imuran or azathioprine was 0.28 over the course of the study versus 0.64 with interferons, p value less than 0.05. There were fewer people who had relapses at all. 57.4% were relapse free with interferons versus 76.6% with azathioprine. Keep in mind, azathioprine can cause gastrointestinal side effects and is an immunosuppressant. So it's not necessarily better, but it is probably more effective, at least at higher doses. There are some technicalities where, for one, Avonex is less effective than beta seron and rebif. So it's hard to say what is exactly driving the effect here. And also, you do have to increase the dose of azathioprine to achieve certain changes in the complete blood count for it to be fully effective. What about Ocrevus versus rituximab? This is data on primary progressive MS for both medications. We'll start with Ocrevus. This is the oratorio trial, Ocrevus versus placebo in PPMS. You can see there was less 12-week confirmed disability progression with Ocrevus compared to placebo. It was modest, but there was a difference, but a virtually identical difference in the Olympus trial, which is rituximab versus placebo in primary progressive MS. And this is not a small problem when you take into account the cost of prescription drugs in the United States and other countries as well. When we have this attraction to well-marketed, FDA-approved, rubber stamp products, this is the consequence. I already mentioned Ocrevus versus Rituximab. Abagio has an identical 
active ingredient to Arava. Look at the difference in price. I have a separate video on that exact topic in the comments below. Maven clad is a pill, but is it really worth that much more than subcutaneous cladribine or even intravenous fludarabine, which is similar, not identical? Casimpta sounds new and shiny. It's subcutaneous ofatumumab, but ofatumumab has been used to treat cancer for years in the form of intravenous Arzera. So again, I'm not trying to pick on MSAA. I think it's a good organization. I think this guide could be useful to people to get a general idea of the medications that are out there, but you got to be very careful what you read on the internet. And unfortunately, this bias is very prevalent and I don't think I can fight against it. I don't think anything I say on this camera will convince people, but my personal opinion is we shouldn't take the economic interests of pharmaceutical companies into our consideration at all. We should only judge drugs based on their efficacy and safety data. I'd be interested to know, did I convince you? Were you able to anticipate what I was going to say? Or did it blindside you? And do you think I'm right or wrong? And do you have suggestions for other videos?